If you've ever had lower back pain, chances are pretty high that somebody told you you either had lower cross syndrome or an anterior pelvic tilt. An anterior pelvic tilt refers to when the pelvis is rotated forward, where lower cross syndrome is a collection of different findings where we have weak abdominals and weak gluteal muscles, and then tightness of the back extensors as well as the hip flexors. But does the research support these findings as a cause for low back pain? In this video, we'll go over the diagnosis as well as the relationship of these findings with lower back pain. When assessing for anterior pelvic tilt, one of the more common ways is to look at the PSIS and the ASIS and look at this angle here to see if the pelvis is rotated forward. But there's a problem with this method. And the problem is, is that there's actually a lot of variation in the anatomy of the pelvis. So this study here, what they did was they looked at 30 different pelvises and they looked at the location of the PSIS versus the ASIS. And what they found is that it varied between pelvises by about 23 degrees. And the problem obviously is that when we look at a neutral pelvis and then this angle changes by 23 degrees between different pelvises, some people are going to be diagnosed as an anterior pelvic tilt, maybe some are gonna be posterior pelvic tilt, all based on the anatomy and not actually if the pelvis is actually rotated or not. Additionally, they found that when they compared side to side, there was about 11 degree difference in some pelvises. So even in the same person, the location of the ASIS and the PSIS aren't actually in the same location, which means that some people are going to be diagnosed with a right uh, anterior pelvic tilt, but actually that just has to do with the anatomy and not actually rotation, again, of the pelvis. And then when we look at lower cross syndrome and the assessment of tightness of various muscles, again, we run into some problems. The most common way to assess for hip flexor tightness is with the modified Thomas test. And what we would do in this test is that somebody would lay on the table with both their legs hanging off the table. They would bring one leg to their chest and then the other one would stay off the table. And we would assess to see where the thigh is. And if it's raised up, the thought was that it would be because the hip flexor is tight, whereas if it goes down below parallel, then the hip flexor isn't an issue. However, this research article found that if we don't control for movement in the spine as well as the pelvis, then this isn't actually an accurate method to assess for hip flexor tightness. And the problem, again, is that we probably aren't actually able to control for movement in the lumbar or the pelvis region. It's going to move no matter how hard we actually try to control for it. And so whenever we're actually using this test to assess for hip flexor tightness, we're not actually able to isolate just the hip flexor. We're going to see some spine movement and we're going to see some pelvic movement, which means that we're just not able to actually identify if the hip flexor is actually tight. And we see a similar issue when looking at back extensor tightness. The physical exam tests that we use in clinical practice don't seem to actually correlate with back extensor stiffness. So the tests that we're using don't seem to actually be helpful in identifying whether those muscles are actually stiff or not. So putting this all together, we can probably identify if somebody has weakness of a specific muscle by comparing it to some sort of normative value. So if we're looking at the glutes, we can do glute bridges, or if we're looking at the abdominals, we could do sit-ups, for example. However, when we're looking at anterior pelvic tilt, or if we're looking at stiffness of either the hip flexors or the back extensor muscles, we see that there's some challenges in actually being able to diagnose these in somebody with low back pain. But let's say we're able to identify if someone has an anterior pelvic tilt or lower cross syndrome. What's the relationship between those and low back pain? First, let's look at the individual components that make up lower cross syndrome and their association with low back pain. Despite the popularity of hip flexor tightness and hip flexor stretching for the treatment of lower back pain, the research has actually found that there's no association between hip flexor tightness and the presence of lower back pain. And this research isn't even actually new. We've actually had research since 1988 that has supported that there's no association. In fact, research has actually found that it's hip flexor weakness that is associated with lower back pain. So maybe we should be strengthening it instead of stretching it. And when looking at whether stretching the hip flexors actually makes a change to either the amount of anterior pelvic tilt or the amount of curve in the lower back, this research article found that three minutes of stretching the hip flexors resulted in a one degree change in anterior pelvic tilt, and we can debate whether that's actually clinically relevant or not. And then it had no change on the amount of curve in the lower back. And both of these changes, well, I guess just the changes in the anterior pelvic tilt were immediately after stretching. It doesn't actually appear that these changes last for a long period of time afterwards. Now, when looking at back extensor tightness, there are a couple of studies that show that there's an association between increased back extensor tightness and lower back pain, but there's a couple caveats here. The first is that this association is actually very small, especially when we compare it to the association of back extensor endurance times. The problem is that when most people think of back extensor tightness, the answer is to stretch it. But when we look at the research, it actually seems that this tightness is more of a protective feeling. 
and that really we should be strengthening those back extensors to help decrease that tightness. The second thing is that reducing back extensor tightness doesn't appear correlated with an improvement of symptoms, meaning that even if we do decrease back extensor tightness, it doesn't mean that there's going to be a reduction in pain. So this makes us think that back extensor tightness is more of a protective mechanism instead of a cause. So if we're actually looking at trying to decrease the pain overall, back extensor tightness really isn't what we should be aiming for. For gluteal weakness, we do see that there's an association with weak glutes and low back pain. But when it comes to muscle activity, we see that there actually isn't a difference between those with lower back pain compared to those without low back pain. So we see that strength is reduced in those with low back pain, but it would be a stretch to say that they're underactive or inhibited based on the current research. For abdominal weakness, we see that there's an association with lower back pain, but again, that association is really small. Without turning this video into an entire statistics video, here are some of the values for the strength of the associations, just so you can get an idea. So when we look at back extensor endurance, that strength of the association was 110. When looking at back extensor tightness, that association was 10. And then when looking at abdominal strength, that association was seven. So we can see that there's association with all of them. However, there's a big difference between back extensor endurance and then abdominal strength. And again, if we look at whether strength of the abdominals actually makes a change to the amount of anterior pelvic tilt or the amount of lordosis in the spine, this study here was an eight-week strengthening program, and they found that they did strengthen the abdominal muscles, but there actually wasn't any change to the amount of anterior pelvic tilt or the amount of lordosis in the spine. But what if we look at the association between increased curve in the lower back and low back pain? Well, this doesn't support lower cross syndrome or anterior pelvic tilt either. This systematic review, which included 13 different studies, found that it was actually reduced amount of curve in the lower back that was associated with lower back pain, literally the opposite of what is commonly thought with anterior pelvic tilt or lower cross syndrome. Additionally, this 2022 systematic review of systematic reviews found that there was an association between reduced amount of curve in the lower back and low back pain. So even a study that summarized all the systematic reviews on this topic, so everything that we know on the association between curves in the lower back and low back pain, found that the association was actually the opposite of what we commonly think, that it's actually a reduced amount of curve in the lower back that's associated with low back pain. So when it comes to anterior pelvic tilt and lower cross syndrome, there are definitely some issues with being able to diagnose these as well as the relationship with lower back pain. Now, does this mean that the exercises that are commonly recommended for anterior pelvic tilt or lower cross syndrome useless? No we see that there are a variety of different exercise options that can be effective for the treatment of lower back pain. We just don't need to worry about focusing on changing the amount of anterior pelvic tilt or specifically addressing the muscles with lower cross syndrome. So hopefully this video on lower cross syndrome and anterior pelvic tilt was helpful. If it was, go ahead and give this video a big thumbs up. If you wanna see more of my content, hit the subscribe button over here. I'll post a couple videos here for the treatment of lower back pain. See you guys in the next video.